Who was your toughest opponent, Roy? Uh, apart from the referees. A dodgy linesman. Uh, Steve Bruce sticks out to mind, to be fair. Playing him at the, in the Gilligan days. He was making his way in the game. As was I. Never murmured, never said a word. Did his bit for his team and his teammates. We banged heads for hour after hour. Never a word said. No one complained. End of the game, big handshake. Pint of beer in the players' bar. He sticks out in my mind, to be fair. I'll give Tony Adams a clump one day. A serious clump. And my left arm went all pins and needles. So I knew I was in trouble. Because I put Tony in the same bracket as them. Two warriors, in my humble opinion. Do you think there are any hard men in the game today? Yeah. Do you want to elaborate on that? Um, honestly, listen, you look at the, the, the John Terry, you know, he's a, notorious for being a bit of a dipstick. He comes on as a centre half with socks rolled over his knees. If it's Cristiano Ronaldo, I'll, I'll have that. If it was a Thierry Henry, but a centre half, and he struts around the place, thinks he's Charlie Potatoes. I can't think now, and all you football fans out there, think of a warrior in the Premier League. And I'm talking about a warrior like a Roy Keane that tackles, puts his body on the line and does a job 90 minutes, week in, week out for the team. In my humble opinion, that's a warrior. Premier League, can't think of one. People say there's no characters in the game anymore, Roy. And obviously, one of the people that will get, gets the Maverick tag these days as a modern-day character is Mario Balotelli at Manchester uh, City. What, what do you make of him? Well, you know what? I suppose it's hard, the modern day game, because I think we do miss the physical side of it and the challenges and two warriors bashing bones together for the good of their teams. So who can you make notorious and give a name? Joey Barton, who was an absolute dipstick again. He's like, there's a Joey Barton in this world. Um, Balotelli, because he's eccentric. You know, he's not a character. I think Joey Barton goes on Twitter. Footballers on Twitter. My day, there was no time for that. It was in the pub. And you was bonding with your teammates and talking about the next game and how tough you were going to be for one another. So I think you talk about characters. Balotelli is an eccentric. You know, he smokes his fags. He picks up three girls, fair play to him, in his Bentley. He goes in the local boozer and spends two grand on the locals. Because you know what? Looking at him as a young man, he wants people to love him, as I did when I played. You want people to respect you for what you do. But characters, again, Premier League, that's an awful lot of footballers. Nah, can't think of one. How long would you last in the modern game, do you think, on the pitch? Uh, well, if they had allowed me to warm up, um, yeah, I think I'd be happy to get through the warm up. Um, it's the modern day game. The f money has dis destroyed the modern day game, in my humble opinion. Um, referees are now supposedly full time, getting 90, 100 grand a year. I spoke to Mark Halsey about three weeks ago, we did a charity thing, a Q&A for cancer. And he's telling me that that's the sort of money they earn. They're put under pressure by video cameras because the assessor, after the game, if he's not seen it as he's seen it, he will assess it by, by video evidence and mark him down even more. That's pressure. For me, mate, I wouldn't last two seconds in the modern day game because I used to put my body on the line like people did like the Soonuses, the Keens years ago. But there's no room for that now. It's all about, I don't know what you call it, to be honest. It's all about let's all be nice and pretty and, and hopefully win a few games. It's not for me, I've got to tell you. I'm falling out of love with the modern day game very, very quickly. And it was in my blood for 35, 40 years. Do you think football now is a non-contact sport? Contact? You can't even look at each other. Um, it's, again, I, I firmly believe it's taken the enjoyment of fans away of seeing people fighting for the team, the shirt and the badge. But you know what? The foreign players have brought that to our game. They're happy sitting in a stand on 85, 90 grand a week. Would not worry about getting dirty and get some sweat on that shirt and that badge. There's a few English players around. I still think give their best for 90 minutes. Um, but to be honest, I've said to you, I'm falling out of love with the game and, and there's several reasons. It's just, it's not for me anymore. Who are those players that you would still respect today that you've just uh, referred to? I mean, that's a tough question. Ryan Giggs, spring straight to mind, Paul Scholes because they do the proper job. Rooney is the third best striker or player in the world. He's old school for me. He fights for the cause. He makes mistakes sometimes physically because he cares. But what's wrong with seeing a player care for his team and his shirt? That's what's made Rooney the third best player in the world. You know, let me think an Arsenal player I could respect. I wouldn't say respect because I don't see people put their bodies on the line like we had to do to earn our contracts. 
uh, Tottenham Hotspur. Gareth Bale's okay. He'll have one blinding game and then six bad ones. It's hard. That's a tough question because respect. All I can see: Chelsea, Arsenal, Manchester City, now foreign players from Argentina, from the Ivory Coast. They don't always like to put a shirt on and fight for their club and their badge because they haven't got the background of being brought up in the English country that you fight for your lives. When you're earning a living, you fight for your life. They don't have to worry about that anymore. Obviously, during your career, you come up uh, against a lot of managers that were players then who are now in the Premier League, Premier League managers, successful Premier League managers. Yeah. Can, you, can you tell us a, just a bit about your runnings with those over the years? Well, you know what? Please, everyone, pick up the book because it'll make you laugh. Um, three springs to my straight away. I played with David Moyes, who's done a magnificent job at Everton. But he's playing in my team. And I, I think it goes down in history. as the worst team Cambridge United ever had. And I was signed back to save them from relegation. No pressure there, the big fella. I'm drinking about 80 pints of lager a week and I've got to save this team from relegation. David Moyes. Six foot four ginger. Big jock from Glasgow. But him and his two little mates, Alan Comfort, Graham Daniels, little black book in the corner. My black book was who's the next bloke I'm going to chin because he's, he's done me some damage. We'll come to him in a minute. Theirs was the Bible. They become born again Christians. David Moyes playing at the back and I'm fighting for my life and the team fighting relegation. Unbelievable. Moyes, though, has done a great job as a manager. But as a teammate at the time, not for me, because he wouldn't battle like I did. Uh, there's a little Welshman. I have a shocking record against the Welsh, and I've drunk with some Welsh people, so it's not personal. But Tony Pulis at Stoke City now. I let, let Bobby Moore down that day, seven minutes, straight red card, because the fella had spat in my face the game before, going back 12 months. Now, you don't forget that. I was only about 23, 24. And due to his shocking first touch, at Roots Hall in FA Cup tie, he controlled the ball off his knee, his shin, and it was up around his neck. And unfortunately, I was about five yards away. And Bruce Lee was en vogue at the time, the Kung Fu. I Kung Fu'd the ball, thinking I'll follow through, I'm taking this fella out, lock, sock and bow. That's exactly what I did. Seven minutes straight record. Sorry, Bobby Moore. And my favourite of all favourites, who was a millionaire manager, Martin O'Neill, Celtic, Aston Villa, now at Sunderland. It was Wickham Wonders when I was a manager at Colchester. I ran the club on my own. He had an entourage of seven behind him, spending 20, 30 grand. We won the League and Cup double. They won this Mickey Mouse trophy from the conference. Well, I can't remember what it was called. Um, multi-millionaire manager. 4-4-2. Work hard, don't play. Stick it in the channels. And let's work hard, be hard to beat. But I wonder how many millions he spent to become a multi-millionaire manager. And I look at the job he'll do for Sunderland. If he gets them in the top half, he'll be a hero. He'll spend all their money. When the going gets tough, Mr O'Neill will be out the door, going down the shops with his missus. Obviously, you hold the record for red cards, 22. Any regrets? Uh, of red cards? Uh, you know what? I suppose the one I regret, and he was a good lad, he was a lovely kid, and I bought him a pint of beer in the bar afterwards. I elbowed Keith McPherson at Northampton Town. He was ex-West Ham boy. Uh, black lad, lovely kid on and off the pitch, but it was a game that I was being dominated by the centre half, not physically, but he kept winning headers. And I took it as a personal slight on me, as a man and as a target man, that if I lost a header, I took it very personally. He kept coming late over the top of me and nicking the headers off me, which never happened. And coming up to half time at Roots all again, cool, I got a few red cards there, didn't I? Um, he's come over the top of me again and won a header, and I threw a forearm smash like this. It was like slow motion. And on full arm extension, I hit him full in the face, broke his nose, knocked the fella spark out. So I didn't really have to wait for the referee then either. I was right by the time I just walked off straight down the tunnel. I regret that one. I apologise to the lad because he didn't deserve it. And that's the only one you regret? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Maybe Bobby Moore. I, I let Bob down and the team. But, you know, Welsh, Tony Pullis and, you know, goes back a while and you're a young man, full of adrenaline. And because the bloke couldn't play the game, shocking first touch, it was an opening invite to come through kick the fella. So, it was going to happen. Obviously in your career at Birmingham City as a youngster, at Chelsea as a youngster, and then later on at South End, you played with the three main men who won England the World Cup in 1966. Yeah. Uh, Sir Ralph yeah. Ramsey at Birmingham was your manager, Jeff yeah. Hurst signed you for Chelsea, and Bobby Moore signed you for South End. Those three characters are obviously icons of the world game. What's your assessment of those three guys? Does that make me an icon? Be nice, wouldn't it? Uh, listen, Bobby Moore, mate, was off another planet. People talk. I've spoken to John Motson the other night about Bobby Moore, and, and someone asked 
was he the man that, to be perceived and what people expected? He was the man and some. The fellow was a complete and utter gentleman. He was a, just a lovely bloke, fit lad. Too nice for football. Should never have been a manager. Bobby Charlton suffered the same. Too nice to be a manager. Because he was too a nice, genuine, respectable man, I suppose. And football's never really that way because sometimes you either have to set the mark to win a game. And sometimes that might mean disrespecting the left back or I've just punched in the face so I can get a crossing to get the winning goal. So the game was probably wrong for Bobby because he was a gentleman. Sir Alf, same sort of thing. How could you not play for Sir Alf Ramsey? And for me, what a quote of all quotes. He said, Roy, have you got a moment? I said, what, Sir Alf Ramsey's talking to me? I went, oh, yeah, yeah. Very shy in those days, 18, 19. Just to let you know, Roy, you're in my first team squad because I think you're a jolly good footballer. Oh, if you'll do for me, Sir Alf, thanks very much. Went home and told everyone in the house. Uh, the other fella, he's now a Sir Jeff Hurst, signed me at Chelsea, nearly finished my career. He was shocking. Sorry, Jeff, shocking. His number two was Bobby Gould, who went on to become an international manager, even more shocking. I've just moved away from home as a 21 year old boy, signed for Chelsea 30 grand. It was my move back to the, the, the top level, if you like, big club Chelsea from Warsaw thinking I've made the step up, I cut my drinking down again because I hadn't quite fallen out of loving myself as much as I, I did later on and lost respect for myself and Jeff was a shocker. Chelsea Football Club was Fred Carnos. I can't say any more than that to be honest because it was a shambles and I nearly quit the game of football because of what happened to me. I walked away from a three and a half year contract at Chelsea because Jeff didn't see me play, didn't know what I was doing and it broke my heart to be fair. When you look back now, obviously, as well as the red cars, you know, you're uh, just as well known for your, your drinking and your womanising. When you look back now, can you believe that you actually had such a long career, 20 years plus as a footballer, with the you know, amazing amounts of alcohol you managed to consume at the same time? Unbelievable. I mean, today, I wouldn't, I would, they wouldn't allow me in the dressing room because all these nutritionists or whatever you call them, they'd smell my breath and go, you can't play because you're drunk. But I played that for maybe 10, 12 years when I'd lost respect for myself, the way the game had treated me with transfers. Um, and it was looking back in hindsight, listen, you cannot buy experience. Wish we could, hindsight's fantastic. Um, cost me a fortune, spent fortunes on beer. But because I'd lost respect for myself and my career, the thing, the answer was lager and girls. And you know, in a, in a silly way, if a psychologist spoke to me, <clears throat> adoration's not fair because I didn't treat the girls that well. But I think they did a good job on most of them, to be fair, because they always thanked me afterwards. But maybe that was the adoration or something I wanted or the buzz because my career, I felt, had gone down the pan. So the drink and the women was an easy... I suppose as a young, fit man, it was an easy escape. And what I did for 10 years, I suppose, was escapism. So, back to the girls. What's your pulling technique and who was your best conquest? I didn't have a technique, listen. You'd never see me on a dance floor because you spilt too much beer. Um, you just knew. Because I was in the clubs, and trust me, in that, the, the drinking era, six nights a week. The only night I didn't go to a nightclub was the night before a game because I'd keep it down to 10 or 12 pints because my body could deal with that and playing at the levels I was playing at, I knew I'd be okay the next day. So six nights a week in the bars and the clubs, what happens, you see the girls who are at it. I knew every girl that was at it. So in the end it would be, hello my love, what's your name again? Half a lager please. We're going home, in 20 minutes we're at it. And then I'd explain to them what I was going to do for them. And you know what, I got slapped once in 15 years of drinking and womanising because she didn't like what I said to her. The rest of them, no problem. And your best conquest? Uh, Kevin Dillon's ex-girlfriend, so I perhaps call it sloppy seconds if I have to. Miss United Kingdom, top seven of the TV. You remember the old days, you had all the bikinis, they'd come out, Miss UK was big on the TV. And Christine was her name, lovely thing, massive long dark hair, beautiful looking thing. She came fifth or sixth, I think. And I saw her in a nightclub, which I frequented, but she was with a boyfriend. And about 1.30, I'd said her, no, I didn't tell her a couple of times. And at 20 to 2, closing at 2, she was on her own at the bar. So I went, are you okay? She went, yeah, he was a dipstick, he's gone. So half a lager. Pound of petrol in a mini, drove from Birmingham Airport, the Aero nightclub, to Sutton Coalfield. I think within 45 minutes, pound of petrol, half a lager, I was in the knickers. That was no mean feat.
And obviously, all these years later now, you're a best-selling author with your book Red Card Roy. How do you feel about that? I said, listen, I've got to tell you, your Bernie Friend wrote the book, done a magnificent job with Vision Publishing, who again I met the other day. And to be fair, to do what they did, I sat with Bernie for 40 hours over a lager by a pool in the Algarve, talking about what I used to get up to. But Bernie, to be fair, said it would be a good story, and I felt it might be. Um, I'm disappointed mum and dad are not here to see it. What, to have my autobiography on the street? Doing well. Number one on Amazon. All the national press want interviews because it's a good, honest, genuine read of someone who was honest as a player. Ask any teammate of mine who was their favourite player, or I say I should call myself your favourite player, but who loved me for what I did. They'd all give me marks of 8.5, 9 out of 10. So to have my book on the streets going really well, you don't realise how chuffed I am.